seven million more Americans would be working today and per capita income would be four thousand dollars higher than it is today sixteen thousand dollars higher for a family of four mr. speaker freedom works it's time we put it back to work yield back gentleman's time has expired the chair now recognizes the gentlelady from California, Florida from Wasserman Schultz for five minutes thank you Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I rise today in recognition of National Work and Family Month. As a mother of young kids in a household with two working parents, I know all too well the daily struggle facing today's American families. How can we be great parents and also be great at our jobs? This summer, when I was home in my congressional district, a constituent raised a question that particularly struck me. Can you imagine what a typical work week would look like if suddenly, without warning, every single child care provider failed to show up to work and left parents with no alternative child care options. From Wall Street to Main Street, America's businesses would come to a grinding halt. And the carefully spun web of endless schedules and systems and to-do lists that we've created to make it all work would unravel. With the number of parents working full-time on the rise, more and more families are fully engaged in the daily juggling act that comes with trying to do it all. Particularly in today's economy when secure employment has become more tenuous. Parents have become increasingly hesitant to ask their employers for greater, fle greater flexibility in their work schedule, to encourage their company to open a daycare center, or to ask for the option to work remotely. If anything, the current economic climate has led to an even greater need for increased flexibility. Thousands of parents are at home not by choice, but because they lost their jobs and have not yet had the opportunity to re-enter the workplace. These parents may be at home, but looking for employment is a full-time job. With thousands of American families experiencing this situation as we speak, we are hearing too many stories about parents who couldn't get to an interview, a networking opportunity, or a job training session because their partners didn't have the flexibility in their work arrangements to make it work. Studies show that employees and their families are not the only ones to benefit from greater workplace flexibility. From improved productivity and efficiency to higher employee morale, flexible work arrangements benefit employers and can help businesses reach their fullest potential. In the last decade, we've seen significant strides made toward improving the great juggling act that is work-life balance. We cannot let this progress slip away during these challenging economic times. In the spirit of National Work and Family Month, I urge my fellow policymakers, employers, and employees to pause this month to think about how we can better work together to make it just a little bit easier for today's families. Attending the school play, tending to a sick child, or just being able to meet your family's needs makes a huge difference in the morale and work ethic of an employee. Achieving work-life balance makes for a more productive employee and a more loyal one. I encourage all employers to assist their employees in achieving this balance. It will reap immeasurable benefits for both the workplace and for our families. Thank you. I yield back the balance of my time. The gentlelady yields back. The chair recognizes the gentleman from South Carolina, Mr. Gowdy, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Milt and Susie Smith from Spartanburg, South Carolina, are parents to three wonderful sons. Doug Smith is a former Speaker Pro Tem of the South Carolina House of Representatives. Stuart Smith is a brilliant real estate mind and a world-class Sunday school teacher. But, Mr. Speaker, I rise today in praise of their third son, Chip. Chip Smith is from Spartanburg, South Carolina, and his company, Blue Ridge Log Cabins, employs nearly 100 people in the 4th Congressional District. Blue Ridge Log Cabins is an innovator and a national leader in the modular log cabin industry and one of the fastest-growing privately held companies in the nation. But, Mr. Speaker, I am not here to talk about that today. I'm here to talk about something even more significant and special than that. On Sunday, September 25th of this year, Extreme Makeover Home Edition spotlighted the efforts of Blue Ridge Log Cabins in their season opening episode on ABC. Over 10 million viewers witnessed the donation made by Blue Ridge Log Cabins to Barbara Marshall of Fayetteville, North Carolina. Chip Smith decided to build Steps and Stages Jubilee House to serve as a shelter for homeless female military veterans. Chip's generosity and Barbara Marshall's vision are providing an invaluable service to those who have sacrificed their safety for hours. 
This 8,000 square foot facility will provide the most basic necessity to those who cannot provide it for themselves, which is shelter. And when it comes to our veterans, Mr. Speaker, it is imperative that we encourage efforts like this and help those in need. So Chip, thank you and your company for putting your time and treasure to use to help others. And Mr. Speaker, times are tough and people are hurting. The greatness of the American spirit is even in those times. We still reach out to others who are in need. So I am proud to call Chip Smith a constituent. I'm even prouder to call him my friend. And I yield back. The gentleman yields back. Chair recognizes the gentleman from Connecticut, Mr. Murphy, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker and colleagues, America is not broke. So Republicans should stop saying it. Conservative pundits should stop spreading it because this country isn't broke. Now, our government temporarily is, and millions of American families are. But our nation is not. And my hypothesis is this. If we don't wake up to this fact soon, if we don't start investing our, nation, our nation's riches in spreading wealth out across this economy, then our whole economy is sunk, whether you're rich or you're poor. So let's try to debunk this myth once and for all, that America is broke, that we can't afford these investments. And let's start here. It's pretty simple. The United States is still a global leader. We are still the richest country in the world on a per capita basis. For all the talk about the rise of India and China and Brazil, you take their population-adjusted wealth and combine it together, and they are still 50% of U.S. wealth. But so if our country is still wealthy, we need to understand that we've made a choice to keep our government poor. Now, why is that? Contrary to popular belief, it's not because discretionary spending is run amok. Take a look at this chart. Discretionary spending has essentially remained stable over time. We've had a brief uptick with a couple extraordinary pieces of legislation, but discretionary spending has remained stable. Don't believe this chart? Take a look at this. If government is growing at extraordinary rates, you'd expect for government employees to be growing at extraordinary rates as well. That's not true either. In fact, we have 16,000 less federal employees than we did in 1970. And as you can see, the trend line just from 1990 continues to go down as well. Now, this isn't all to say that government can't get leaner and meaner. It's just a suggestion that there's another culprit at work. And that other culprit is revenue. Despite what you hear on TV, despite what you hear on Fox News today, Taxes as a percentage of GDP today are at a 60-year low. Right now, we are collecting about 15% of our GDP in taxes. The problem isn't just that the government is broke. It's that we've made a decision, effectively, to keep it broke. Now, if the government isn't broke and this country is still the richest in the world, why is it that so many families feel broke? Why is it so many families are broke? Well, let's, let's explore that for a second. Here's the problem right here. Over the last 60 years, incomes for the bottom 99% of Americans have basically remained flat. And what that has meant is that all of the additional wealth that we've accumulated in this nation has gone to the richest 1%, such as their incomes during that same time have increased by almost 300%. You want to see it in even starker terms? Then take a look at this chart. The 400 wealthiest Americans have a net worth that is greater than the net worth of the 100 million poorest Americans. Let me say that again. The 400 richest of us have more money than the 100 million poorest of us. Now, Having said all of this, let me say this. Getting rich is good. It's great. The richest 400 people didn't steal this money. They made it legally. We just have to start having policies in this country that make more people rich, that make more people feel rich. And so we need to be having a debate in this country right now about how we do that, about how we put policies in place to lift more people into the ranks of those that have enough to succeed. Because an economy with this kind of wealth disparity, combined with an unwillingness to make the investments to shrink it, 
is destined to collapse. And this isn't about pitting one group against another. This is just about economics. It's not class warfare to suggest that as an economy we'd be stronger if incomes were rising for a few more people than the top 1%, the people who tend to spend domestically, the middle class, rather than invest internationally. It's not class warfare to suggest that our economy would be stronger if more of our nation's wealth went to local innovators and small businesses rather than to big multinational companies that tend to take income from the United States and use it to create employment overseas. And it's not class warfare to suggest that our economy would be stronger if more kids had access to the ultimate wealth creator, higher education, if we were investing our nation's riches in making college cheaper. You know what? If we have this discussion, everybody, not just the bottom 99% benefits from the discussion. My friends, the government is temporarily broke. Millions of American families are broke. But our nation is not broke. We're just pretending that we are. And here's the thing. If we don't wake up from this dream soon, what is fiction today will be fact before we know it. I yield back the balance of my time. The gentleman's time has expired. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Brady, for five minutes. Mr. Speaker, thank you. Uh, my district and the people of Southeast Texas know and understand uh, the devastating hurricanes uh, and what they bring to our communities having survived Hurricane Rita uh, and Ike. This past September, we dealt with a very different type of disaster in the form of major wildfires in Jasper counties, Tyler counties, Trinity Walker, and my home county of Montgomery. Luckily for us, we were also granted our September miracle on Labor Day weekend as fire crews from across Texas and, in um, fact, the entire country came to Magnolia to battle a three-county blaze that threatened to consume well over 10,000 homes and businesses in Magnolia as well as 1,000 more thousands more in neighboring Grimes and Waller counties. In fact, uh, if you look uh, at this map, you can see the structures uh, lost in Montgomery County were a fraction of a percent of those saved by brave fire crews. The fire was in this area outlined here, but you can see in the red, the yellow, the green, and the blue going out. All the homes, the thousands of homes, and small businesses uh, who were saved by the actions of our local firefighters. I had the privilege to go up twice to those uh, fire uh, areas uh, to see for myself how the fire lines came right up to these homes within five feet of their front door and somehow our firefighters saved them. And then they did it at the home next to it and the home next to that. Uh, it is impossible for me and for anyone who could see that not to be in awe of these heroes. Their skill and dedication saved the town of Magnolia. And I can't wait to join them this Saturday in Unity Park to honor their success and their hard work. Chief Gary Vincent led the Magnolia Volunteer Firefighters and exemplified their motto, a community of unity. Gary united over a hundred different firefighting agencies by his side. The chief also had help from our dedicated sheriff, Tommy Gage, and his deputies, our constables, our police departments, our terrific fire marshal, Jimmy Williams, who you need to meet, our school districts and the Texas Forest Service, just to name a few of the people and agencies that stepped up like you can't believe. California, California sent uh, from the federal government an interagency incident management team, and I think they had their eyes open. They got to see what happened what happens when a community rallies together as volunteers, uh, and it was a sight to behold. Everyday Texans, everyday citizens in the Magnolia, Montgomery County area joined with our charity agencies from United Way, the Red Cross, our local food banks, our churches, YMCAs, and Chambers of Commerce to provide a response that our firefighters across this nation will be talking about for years to come. We saw the best of our communities and the massive volunteer effort to feed, clothe, and take care of our bravest. At the Magnolia West High School staging area, I got to tour. If a firefighter was thirsty, three volunteers would rush over with a bottle of water, and there was likely two more behind them carrying a hot meal, just in case that firefighter might be hungry. In speaking with the firefighters who came in from across the country, 
All they could talk about was how well they were treated by the community of Magnolia. They came in looking for water and a FEMA bar, and what they got was home-cooked meals, fresh clothes, and necessities. And if they asked for it, a volunteer found it and brought it uh, right over. And when these volunteers ran low, they simply sent out a message on Facebook to the community. Within three hours, that gymnasium, that staging area, the ag barn, was filled to the brim again. It was amazing. The outpouring of love and support was truly a sight to behold. It's no wonder back home we consider this God's country. Today, it's an honor for me to be here on the House floor to honor uh, our heroes. Without all of you, thousands of families wouldn't have homes to go to tonight or businesses uh, to go work to. The proof is right here on this map. This Saturday afternoon in Unity Park in Magnolia, our community will come together to honor the men and women who beat back fire, held the line, and saved our community. We'll also honor them by heeding their warnings that the fire danger remains extraordinarily high. We must remain vigilant in our prevention efforts. That's another way we can honor our braves who spent the month of September away from their families, saving homes and businesses in our community. God bless our firefighters. God bless our volunteers and all who supported them. And God bless our community. With that, Mr. Speaker, I yield back. The gentleman yields back. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Kansas, Mr. Yoder, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Today I rise to recognize the service and sacrifice of our nation's veterans and military service members who have answered our country's call to serve. Last month, we commemorated the 10th anniversary of the attacks of September 11, 2001, in remembrance of the victims and their families, while at the same time recognizing the need for continued vigilance as the United States seeks to rid the world of terrorism. This month, we commemorate the 10th anniversary of the Afga Afghanistan War. Ten years later, our nation is safer as a direct result of the voluntary service of men and women who are willing to place themselves in harm's way, often under circumstances many Americans cannot fathom. This willingness to serve and dedication to duty remains consistent, as with previous generations of veterans who chose to serve their country during our greatest time of need. Unfortunately, we have lost some of our greatest treasure in our fight against terrorism. Since October 2001, 4,914 service members have been killed and another 46,376 injured as a result of military action in Iraq and Afghanistan. Recently, we again faced a tragic loss of life. On August 6th, a CH-46 Chinook twin rotor helicopter carrying U.S. Army soldiers, U.S. Navy SEALs, and Afghan soldiers was shot down in the Warnock province of Afghanistan, resulting in the greatest loss of life in any combat incident in the entire conflict thus far. The unit involved, B Company 7th, 158th uh, Aviation, is headquartered in New Century, Kansas, in the southernmost part of my district. Last March, I had the privilege to attend the deployment ceremony for the unit as they departed for training at Fort Bliss ultimately deploying to Afghanistan as part of Operation Enduring Freedom. As my colleagues are well aware, members wanting, uh, as my colleagues are well aware, deployment ceremonies are often somber affairs with family members wanting to spend every last second with their loved ones before they depart for duty and soldiers assuring family members that they will be okay and not to worry. This past August, I was saddened to learn about the tragic events of August 6, 2011 hearing the news that three members of the unit had been killed during the combat operation. These soldiers, Army Specialist Spencer Duncan, Chief Warrant Officer Brian Nichols, and Army Specialist Alexander Bennett, are remembered as outstanding soldiers dedicated to duty, their unit, and each other. Spencer Duncan was just 21, a 2008 graduate of Olathe South High School. He enlisted in the Army Reserve shortly after graduation and before deployment to Afghanistan. He served at the New Century a Air Center Aviation, Aviation Support Facility in Olathe, Kansas. First, he was an aircraft mechanic, and later he trained to become a Chinook door gunner. I had the honor of attending a memorial service for Specialist Duncan and witnessed the outpouring of friends and loving family. Brian Nichols was 31 and a pilot from Kansas City, Missouri, who, in hearing of the need to train people for mobilization, volunteered and sacrificed for our country, 
leaving behind a wife and son. Alexander Bennett was 23 and was trained as a Chinook helicopter flight mechanic. Originally from Tacoma, Washington, he had already served one tour of duty in Iraq in 2009 before being deployed again, this time to Afghanistan. Mr. Speaker, our hearts go out to the families and friends of these three patriotic servicemen who gave the ultimate sacrifice that we all in this, in this country might continue to live in a nation of freedom and liberty. For their service and sacrifice to our nation, a grieving country says thank you. Mr. Speaker, next month we will celebrate Veterans Day and once again remember the service and sacrifice of all of those who have faithfully and duly served in peacetime and war throughout. I yield back the balance of my time. The gentleman yields back. Pursuant to Clause 12A of Rule 1, the Chair declares the House in recess until noon today. And the House returns at noon Eastern for legislative work among today's bills, swamping federal land for compromise in exchange.